the literature, most of them, not to say like 80 or 90 percent of them, come from sediments. And uh, most of them, uh, of these sedimentary records, thank you. most of these sedimentary records uh, were obtained with deposition rates that are somehow lower than five centimeters per kilo year. If we consider that a reversal duration is something like a few kilo years, we are already faced to a real problem, which is the resolution of the records. And the other problem that we could have is the uh, signal itself. So that's two questions which I'd like to address today. Uh, what sort of resolution are we looking at? And what is the meaning that is behind the signal that we are getting? One of the issues also is, um, and this is why I was uh, willing to do this work, when we consider all literature and all models that have been proposed so far regarding the reversal, starting from the fact that the, it could be dominated by a rotating dipole and then by uh, axisymmetric fields and then by uh, some sort of recurrent, recurrent process linking the mantle to the, to the core, to the upper core, and many, many models like that. All of them are controversial and none of them is really accepted at the moment. The reason for that is uh, probably the scatter that we have on the data, and, the, and also the scatter is, as I'm going to show you, probably linked to the, to the fact that we are dealing with sediments. So what we did is a simple experiment which consisted to look at four different reversal records, all obtained from sediments, and uh, with typical deposition rates, comprised between uh, three centimeters per kilo year and uh, 4.5 centimeters per kilo year. And what I'm going to show you now right away is a succession of the demagnetization diagrams that we have across each transitional zone. What you see, and this is actually a common observation that has been barely noted by the, most of the studies, most of the reversal studies done so far, we have some sort of a suitable demagnetization diagrams outside the transition. Each diagram is taken, these diagrams correspond to samples which have been taken every two centimeters within the sediment. But once we reach the transitional zone, as here, as here, we have a very, very large scatter of the directions. Of course, we could attempt to calculate the direction, but this is certainly not a very, very reliable direction. Another example, for a longer transitional zone from the Indian Ocean, again, we have correct demagnetization diagrams outside the transition, but once we reach the transition, we can see that there is a very large scatter of the successive directions, and it's, so that it's very difficult to extract a suitable directions. This can, I've been studying many sediment, um, sedimentary reversals earlier on, and this kind of observations is extremely frequent, not to say systematic. Last one, <clears throat> here we have again uh, good directions, good dike demagnetization outside the transitional intervals, and once we reach the transitional intervals, it's better directions on almost impossible to calculate a suitable direction. We can attempt, we can always calculate uh, directions from uh, even from state of data. And of course, if we do that, we get some uh, successive directions, which here are shown in terms of reversal angle. I'm just showing now the three reversal records. I'm going to talk about the fourth one later on. And uh, if we do that, and if we plot the map value, of course, the map value increases considerably during the transitions because the demagnetization diagrams are not at the right level. <clears throat> so what is uh, uh, original in this record? The fact that the magnetization is really different we have two records with some sort of low magnetization intensity, and we have two other records that have a 
magnetization intensities at least 100 times and even more larger than the other two. Which means that for these intensities, the transitional interval was considerably more magnetized than the uh, polarity intervals that were recorded by the other two records. In one way, for these intervals here, we had correct demagnetization. And for these transitional intervals, we had very bad demagnetization variance. So what is the explanation behind that? One possibility, which has always been uh, considered, is the fact that because the field intensity is very low during the transition, we have a poor magnetic alignment, and therefore we are not able to extract a, correct, a very correct direction. But it doesn't make too much sense if we consider the demagnetization itself, uh, because first of all, it would implicitly assume that all magnetic currents are the similar and on on very uh, tightly grouped for each of these transitional zones. And uh, so therefore we can uh, think of something maybe different. Of course, the first thing we have to check is whether or not there are systematic or, or significant change in uh, magnetic energy or in grand, magnetic grain size. What I am showing here is the mean NRM over ARM value across each of these uh, transitional zones. And you see that there is no large difference. In fact, this parameter, since it's an average value, represent more or less the percent of magnetic grains that have been aligned. I used here the ARM, I could have used the IRM, but that gives exactly the same results. Another parameter that we can investigate, of course, is the S ratio, which gives us an idea about the change in magnetic mineralogy. And another parameter also is the resistance to AF demagnetization, which can be given by uh, the magnetization uh, uh, that was removed between 20 and 60 millitesla, for example. So you see that the, the ARM remains quite constant. The percent of ARM that was removed for each of these transitional intervals is perfectly constant. So we don't have any evidence for magnetic change, I mean, large magnetic change in terms of grain sizes or in terms of magnetic mineralogy. So if we summarize, all magnetic characteristics are unchanged, only the NRM intensity has changed. A similar proportion of magnetic grains was aligned in all records, and therefore the same process has been at work, but we have many more grains that were aligned within the highly magnetized transitional intervals. So the low field intensity plays certainly a role by limiting the number of oriented grains, of course, uh, but a stronger magnetization usually reflects also a, a, probably a larger grain size distribution or even a different, and then on the for a different magnetic behavior. The hypothesis, as I said before, the hypothesis of the low field intensity doesn't really explain why we would not be able to demagnetize so strongly magnetized uh, uh, samples. So what I think is that the problem comes from the field geometry itself. During the reversals, the field intensity drops. We don't have any dipolar field anymore. We have a non-dipolar, a time varying, a fast time varying dipolar field. And because of this, within a two centimeters large sample, we recorded different directions that were the successive non-dipolar directions. And because different directions are recorded within the same sample with magnetic grains that have similar coercivities, we cannot demagnetize. So it means, of course, that all records that were obtained with deposition rates lower than five centimeters per kilo year cannot be used and are incompatible. So probably we should not incorporate those in the database. Also, I would <laughs> recommend that they should be there. Um, 
What should we do? Of course, we can turn towards volcanics, and there are very nice volcanic records. And the other option is also to consider the uh, sediments that were characterized by very high deposition rates. There are very few sediments like that. For those that I have seen so far, the demagnetization characteristics seem to be okay, because of course we don't have this problem of uh, having different components recorded within the same samples. So this is probably the the, this is probably the, the, the future. Another possibility, of course, is to use very, very little samples, which is uh, probably also uh, the future. So we have been talking about three cores. What about the fourth one? The fourth one comes from the Western Equatorial Ocean. And when you look at the same kind of uh, diagrams that I've been showing before, you see a very, a completely different pattern. The inclination, it's an equatorial core, so the inclination remains close to zero. And the declination rotates progressively from south to north. To tell you the truth, I've never seen something like that. So the first time I see something like that. It's just unbelievable. All diagrams look very nice. And there are, of course, no problem of interpretation. And what it looks like, I didn't show you the VGP pass because it was not used, useful to calculate that. But if we are, I had calculated the VGP pass, we would see a rotating dipole along a single longitude line. If you plot all the directions that you have been looking at on the demagnetization diagram, they all fit along a grid circle, a grid circle here. And uh, of course, you can. It's not the field that does that because we know that the dipole. I mean the dipole field has disappeared, or is it so weak that we cannot have a transition like that? There is something different behind. And what is behind, of course, is a PGLN process, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, the, what, it's a simple smearing of the signal, which we can easily simulate by a, a simple uh, uh, calculation. And uh, if we assume a transition that we have, have um, an evolution changing like this one here. A simple three centimeter or five centimeters smearing window is enough to produce a path that goes, that goes this way. Uh, there is another interesting observation behind this record is that when we look at the barium 10 record in terms of intensity, there is a clear offset between the relative final intensity here in black and the barium 10 over barium 9 record in red. For those who are not really familiar with uh, barium, re barium records, I'm going to, to say a few words about it. Barium 10 is produced, produced in the upper atmosphere. It's a spallation product, which uh, involves the galactic cosmic rays <coughs> and um, which um, on, on the nitrogen and, uh, and oxygen uh, atoms. Uh, once the barium 10 has been produced in the upper atmosphere, it goes, uh, it is incorporated uh, within aerosols and, uh, and precipitated into the sediment, either uh, via uh, wet or dry precipitation. It then goes into the water column and finally into the sediment. So because of this uh, uh, long time, we have to take into account the fact that the, the barium tank can be incorporated within the sediment in different ways. And in order to take this effect into account, we have to normalize by barium nine. We have to take into account the various scavenging effects that can be within the sediment and the uh, we have to take into account the ocean circulation, the ocean, the ocean mixing and different parameters like that. That is the reason why we use barium-9. Barium-9 responds in the same way as barium-10. And the fact that uh, this, so the barium-10 over barium-9 reflects the barium production in the upper atmosphere. And the 
I forgot to tell you that, of course, the production of barium in the upper atmosphere is controlled by the field intensity, uh, since the penetration of the galactic cosmic rays depends on the strength of the field. Um, so the fact that uh, these two curves are offset with respect to each other is probably linked to bioturbation. But we must be aware of the fact that bioturbation and offset doesn't necessarily mean that we have a PDM. This is the case in the present situation because we have shown that there is a significant smearing. But uh, sometimes the smearing is not necessarily there. So we could have, a, could have an offset without any significant smearing. If we look at the other record, this one, which is a shorter uh, deposition rate, this one and this one, we see no offset between the barium 10 record and the relative fire intensity. <clears throat> but you can notice also that there is some, all of all the curves agree during the reversal, but there are some disagreements for some of those, especially here, where you have a sort of a precursory event that is not reflected by the barium. That's something that we are working on. We do not clearly understand what's going on there. It could either represent the fact that there is uh, some mixing of the signal, a uh, large mixing of the barium time signal that we have not been taking into account yet. It could also be characteristic of a threshold, but I don't really believe that this is the case. Uh, that's something we, we need to understand further. But still, the agreement is okay. And we can go one step further, consider the detailed record that I've been showing to you, this one which has a PGRM. And if for this record we look, this record is characterized by other reversals that occur at deeper in the core. Uh, and you can see here that we have a very good agreement between the barium 10 over barium 9 production and the relative panel intensity. We can even compare that with a SINT 2000 record, and uh, we find a very good, uh, very satisfactory uh, agreement. This is pleasant because it means that once we have this sort of uh, common variation, we probably can use that as an evaluation of the relative panel intensity study. The scope we have in mind being to incorporate, I mean, to deal with uh, several set of records like that over a long time period and uh, calculate uh, another composite record using the coherency between RPE, I mean, relative high intensity and barium 10. There is something we can do as a check of the suitability of this barium record is to compare the amplitude of the pips. Uh, if we do that um, after, uh, after matching all the records uh, over the same depth, over common depths, we can see that uh, two of these records have significantly higher peaks than two others here. So one way of checking that is to calculate either the height of the peak or the surface of the peak. There are two different ways of looking at that. And if we do that, we see that three of these records are perfectly aligned, uh, whatever the calculation, and the fourth one is clearly offset. The fourth one is a record that comes from the Northern Atlantic. So we could consider that because it comes from a different area, it should it could be uh, it could be characterized by a different response of the barium. But there is no reason for that because barium is mixed up in the upper atmosphere within a few years, one or two years. And uh, which means that in one or two years, we have exactly the same barium distribution in the atmosphere. So whatever the site latitude, we should always see the same peak. Unless, of course, we have a significant change in the field geometry, but that will not happen before the dipole is extremely weak or has weak. So what's going on with this record? The answer is partly here. It happens that when we compare the barium 
10 over barium 9 C nodes that we have been looking at over the entire branch interval with the, isotopic, with the isotopic record that was performed on exactly on the same samples from the same core, we see that they are exactly the same. What is in cause? It's not barium 10, because barium 10, if we plot directly barium 10 without any normalization and compare it to the SAN 2000 record, it doesn't really fit with it. But there is sometimes some coherency. So there is some remaining signal there. The problem is linked to the normalization. The problem is linked to the barium 9. Barium 9 is uh, duplicates again the, uh, the isotopic record, which means that in this specific case, barium 9 is clearly dominated by climate. And uh, because this uh, signal is much larger than this one, of course, the, it's impossible to get a proper normalization and then a proper uh, barium 10 production for this core. It's a Northern Atlantic core, so we can wonder whether some other cores would be affected the same way. We, are all, we already have some other examples, one another core from the Baffin Bay, which had exactly similar characteristics. So maybe we should more or less focus on the equatorial records and on Northern ones. That's something that we are currently investigating also. So in conclusion, we have seen that uh, we have almost poor system uh, magnetic uh, alignment during transitional intervals. The reason, the reason for that is that uh, we have uh, an integration of uh, time varying directions within the same samples, and therefore uh, we do not document properly these, uh, these, transitional, these transitions. The B10 over B9 ratios that were measured across the four transitional intervals are synchronous, but the RPI change, except in the core with PGRM. On the RPI, on the parent intensity records on the barium 10 over barium 9 variations are very similar for correcting for the offset. I forgot to mention that, which is promising for a future integration of both data sets over the past million years. And since uh, barium 10 over barium, I mean, barium 10 production fits mark the reversal. Uh, the amount of barium 10 is proportional to the deposition rate, except in the northern Atlantic core. In this case, the climatic change implanting the barium 9 record, and therefore, this barium 9 record cannot be used for normalization. We have seen a good example of uh, what can happen. Uh, for the scavenging effects that I was mentioning before, and also a way maybe to discriminate between relative high intensity and uh, uh, barium 10, to use a barium 10 quality record to discriminate also uh, for the quality of the relative high intensity studies. Thank you.
We are not able to have a people to try to go. And what we see during these functional errors is a very low poor alignment, which is caused by the absence of the dipole. So we have a very low intensity, which is simply the result. I'm not saying that we are looking at the non dipole conditions. We are just looking at the low intensity that results from the absence of the light. And so I think the amplitude is not too much question. But that's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, um, so you, the implication from the curve is that the really is not affected by vinyl formation, or is it also mixed into the seven? I'm surprised okay. that you don't get one thing about the other. The other is affected by vinyl formation. But uh, as you can see, the very intent variation is a few of our large intervals. So if we decouple the very intent from the alteration, it doesn't change that much with the width of the signal remains. Nor is the same because the alteration occurs on the relatively narrow width. So it's not too much. How long does it take for the brilliant intent to come into equilibrium with the lower? Uh, <laughs> well, because you know when you're talking about changing the cosmic rate, what you're doing is talking about changing the rates. But the point, I guess, is that you're using the concentration, so that's the interval. So yeah. it makes sense only if really intend to come into equilibrium or change in the uh, cosmic rate. You mean to say that? In, the, in the atmosphere? Oh, it's fast. It's fast. One or two days. One or two days. Yeah. But how long does it take to get that atmosphere? So that takes a lot longer. Huh? And to the same amount, it's very hard. It's expressive pressure. I mean, it's high process. So, it goes okay, how do you what's the slope? It takes a while. Compared to the duration of the transition, of course, it takes a few years. So, it's not a big deal. So, it's going to start in 2009. Mm -hmm. 2,000 year residence time in the ocean. Uh, well, residence time brilliant in the ocean, 2,000 years. That's the default in the church. Uh, well, that's, that's the residence time used, which is linked to the mixing of the ocean. But uh, once, once barium falls into the water, it very rapidly incorporated on a source of tiny particles and those fall down on the I mean, on, on, on signals. These are signals to particles. So, so there is no over time. Particle reactive nature of brilliant head, Dr. Valley is right. Means it predisposed to being scavenged, it's highly particle reactive, and so it's going to be taken out nearly immediately. Um, and that's what, yes, and that's what makes it swept it. up and drips. And, 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 that's and, that's it, that's and it's more, it, it's preferentially um, attached to clay particles, yes. sheet silicates, and yes. small particles. So, in the collapsing zone, much. it's going to be very, and if you're talking about the atmospheric variability. The majority of brilliant tent is in the stratosphere. In order to be rain navigated to make it past the tropopause and into the troposphere. But as the field goes down, there's more production in the troposphere. So it can rain out nearly immediately. Well, the production of the troposphere is around 65 percent at most. And uh, so the mm -hmm. 65 percent is. Yeah, um, just. As, just to put a perspective, I wouldn't try a Holocene PSD study at five, a sediment that's accumulating at five centimeters per thousand years. You wouldn't be able to resolve most of the variations in the Holocene when the field is strong. Absolutely. So there's no reason we should expect it to all of a sudden magically work for a flurry transition where the field is much more complex. We need to find much more, uh, much higher accumulating archives to really get any sort of. Uh, 
Both of you is a very, very tiny scientist. Well, still, though, it doesn't matter. Now, I would say the sediment mixer, I think that the mix layer is going to affect that regardless. Uh, no, you don't have to like two slides. Yeah, but if your sediment locking zone is over an air bowl, which I would suggest it is, it doesn't matter. You, your sampling at bulk is basically equivalent to your lock-in zone, and therefore the only way to get around that is higher sediment. Can I clear up what I want to make one little point about our two analogies? I think we're using different meanings of different words. So when I refer to PDRM, I'm talking about the depth below the mix layer. Yep. Yes, you showed yes. one of my slides. Right. Yeah, it's a uh, um, and so the beryllium tan, of course, its age comes from up here, it hangs out in the mix layer, and then it gets incorporated in the sediment. Mm -hmm. And the sedimentary magnetism is born here, so it's really a resonance kind of mix layer. I know, I would say that's different. Part of it is confusing. I would say that the magnetics function is not flat, but you know, has an angle and is acquired over a zone. So that there is a mixed layer below the mixed layer, there is a PD, there is a lock-in zone that the sediments get locked in, and then it gets smoothed out. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you that the play of show that's true. What? Why you have a mind well dated. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be sure that uh, even if you have the departure to the layer. Part of the magnetization is not progressively already locked within the larger layer. That is a big option because look at this because there is no there is no option. So magnetization has to be required sometimes within the larger layer. <laughs> um, what is the sampling interval on your Berlin 10? The same as for the two centimeters. So you're every two centimeters, you're making a measurement. So that's yeah. over two centimeter interval time interval. Yeah, so this is, I think it's really cool. I think Berlin 10 is the way they all the soft centers coming. I think we have to be clear in the terminology and in what we mean by. Locking and where and, and, and so and, and there's two different things there's smoothing and then there's locking which is different yes, <laughs> and so we, we, I think we get sloppy in our, our words um, but inconsistent in the way and anyway I think we're fine uh, <laughs> do you have a party to go to the time the party stuff uh, the party starts at six um, there are some logistical questions. Some people, I believe, have cars and have both. We have a late agitated to remarks. Yes, I think it's a good one. Yeah, so it's a Um, and uh, 
I think it also, also people who are at the workshop tomorrow and Friday, just a reminder, you probably got an email from the next to talk about helpful software downloads and tips and how to make those, particularly since they examine the PMAC high standalone, which could be a nice way to convert metrics and data into uh, magic formats. It's rather large, and I think we all try to do it on the live side on the right. That's half a people about it. Okay. Um, more <laughs> remarks from the <laughs> All right. So, uh, thank you for coming. We really uh, appreciate you guys coming and the uh, future. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs>